Okay. Okay, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so with uh, the pooled resources session, uh, here we're going to start off with Brian Guest from the UNOL's East Coast Winch Pool. Well, uh, good morning or afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Guest. I'm manager of the East Coast Winch Pool. Uh, next slide. I can figure that out. Mm. <laughs> so the the um, next button is under all my Zoom controls. Sorry about that. Gotcha. There it is. So we're located at the Wood Soul Oceanographic Institution in Wood Soul, Massachusetts. And by now, I'm sure most of you know who we are and what we do, but I will touch on and give a brief summary of our operation. Next slide. Uh, the winch pool is made up of uh, two full-time and one half-time staff members. We make ourselves available to all of our users 24 hours a day, seven days a week via email or phone. Usually the phone calls come in about three o'clock in the morning, but that's okay. Uh, Jamie Haley is our shop steward and mechanical technician responsible for the pre and post cruise preparation of all of our winches, blocks, slip rings, any other borrowed equipment. Jamie also handles uh, the wire winding or strength member winding on our systems in the shop and uh, engineers any mechanical modifications and repairs required to the systems. Josh Eaton is our engineer and maintains all of our electrical systems of our winches. He works closely with the vendors to ensure firmware and software are current working properly. And as a member of the UNL safety committee, he makes sure our systems comply with appendix A and B. My responsibilities include overseeing our budget with an eye on keeping cost to NSF as low as possible without sacrificing quality. I handle all of the scheduling of equipment both to both NSF funded users and non NSF users alike. Part of that scheduling is setting up all the shipping requirements to and from ports. I began my career at UI in 1983 as an electronics technician and have logged more than 85 cruises I've sailed as chief scientist numerous times as well. This gives me a decent working knowledge of how our vessels operate, what we need to provide in many aspects of mobilizing and demobilizing for work at sea. I often work in the shop as a second technician. I provide wire winding services for both UNALs and NOAA vessels and travel to ports to assist with setup and breakdown of our equipment. We also utilize the services of other HUI engineers, technicians, fabricators when needed. Uh, we're very fortunate in that respect at, at Woods Hole. to have so many talented people we can call on, even if only temporarily. Uh, it has been a fairly busy year for us this year. We've fielded 38 requests for equipment. There has been real no slow no slowdown for us over the past two years uh, with COVID or without. Next slide, please. Our shop is a dedicated space for the winch pool. It provides us with about 2,000 square feet of floor space for both maintenance and storage of our systems. It is equipped with a five ton overhead hoist, UNOL's two foot on center bolt pattern deck and deadheads for static load testing up to 8,000 pounds. Uh, we have been working on securing some additional storage space that'll free up some spots in our shop. As you can imagine, if you look at the shop, um, we have 14 systems and gets kind of crowded in there at times. Next slide. So on our systems, they range from the ultralight, which is about a 1500 pound safe working load to a heavy duty mooring winch, which will handle about 10,000 pounds safe working load. Uh, we're currently working closely with InterOcean Systems in California on the fabrication of a new small portable trace metal system that will be added to our inventory and will spend most of its time at Skidaway Institute in Savannah, Georgia. However, it is a shared resource, which includes the winch, non-metallic strength member, uh, CTD and rosette. Uh, the rosette and the CTD unit will be maintained by Skidaway, will be responsible for the winch and we'll have to coordinate use for others. Uh, one interesting point with that winch is it is based on a design by Jamie and Josh and has been licensed into ocean. One of the most interesting features of this winch is the placement of the motor and gearbox within the drum. 
Let's minimize the footprint, greatly reduces the need for heavy framework and allows us to build a small yet strong winch that can be mounted to smaller vessels like the RV Savannah. The uh, University of Vermont is also equipping their new vessel with two much smaller, but same similar style uh, winches through InterOcean. Next slide, please. We have two tension spoolers for winding strength members, and we do have access to a third. It's a Huey owned unit, but we maintain it. It's a diesel powered tensioner. Uh, I'm sure it's about World War II vintage, but it's been very, very useful for us and works just wonderfully. Next slide. Uh, we have an assortment of overboarding blocks, not as many as I'd like, but uh, so far we've been able to provide everybody with what they've requested. We have some heavy 680 blocks. Uh, we have 322 blocks that are trace metal compliant, some wide groove metering shivs. Uh, it's, it's adequate, um, but we should probably add a few to our inventory. They do get requested frequently. Next slide, please. And we have a, an assortment of odds and ends that we don't necessarily loan out individually, but it has been done. Uh, there are slip rings. Uh, we have our uh, East Coast winch pool design turntable. We have motion reference units that some of our winches can utilize to do active heave compensation. And a neat little step up power transformer that allows us to uh, provide 480 volts to our winches from vessels that don't have more than the 220 three phase. Uh, next slide, please. This is oh, a little bit too far. This video I've shown before, it is, it's kind of uh, interesting. People seem to like it last time, but it demonstrates the turntables that we've designed and built in-house mounted to one of our Nash 2K winches. It allows placement of the winch off the center line because you can adjust the position of the winch. You can change the angle, the fleet angle by rotating it and pinning the turntable in increments of about two and a half degrees. Randy, I don't know, but uh, this is a video. You may be able to play it. I think if you mouse over the picture, you should see the control. There you go. And Jamie Haley, Haley is just demonstrating how simple and easy it is to, to rotate the winch, or maybe he won't. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I keep pushing the play button, but it's not. Okay. Well, it, you'll just have to take my word for it. He can easily with uh, one hand, just rotate that winch into any position. And it's nice when everybody wants to utilize the center line of the overboarding block on an A-frame or maybe you want to utilize a crane boom or a A-frame that's mounted on the starboard or port rail. Uh, this allows you to mount it pretty much anywhere on deck and, and turn the winch towards that, that overboarding point. Next slide, please. So we try to make the process for requesting equipment from us as simple as possible by establishing an online equipment request form on our website. Next slide. So once the form is completed, it's sent to us and we can determine which system will be best suited for the needs of the user. And we get in contact with the users to address any questions that may arise from the results of the information they provide in this form. Once this form's filled out and sent to us, you're basically in the queue for the use of the equipment. And, you know, it's a, it's a first come first serve type of situation. Unfortunately, we have limited resources. Um, so far we've been fortunate and we haven't had any real problems with availability, but it's good to get your request in as soon as you know, you're gonna need something with the dates, even if they're tentative and we can modify the form for you later on as dates change. We do that frequently. Next slide, please. You can also look at the website and see how the equipment's scheduled. Um, I know there's a couple of you out there that uh, look at this frequently when requesting equipment from us to see how, uh, what the availability is like. It's a good idea just go ahead and submit your form anyway, because we may not have updated with a cancellation or the ship schedules may have slid or will slide. 
Um, so get their request in and we can deal with those, those uh, date and conflicts uh, quite easily. Next slide, please. So where are we going? Uh, we've got a few modifications we'd like to make to our facility. Uh, the first is to change our five ton overhead hoist. Uh, we've got three systems currently that exceed its capacity and moving that around the shop is tricky at best. The door itself will not accommodate our larger forklifts to lift the larger winches. So we have a series of rollers that we've been able to place the winches on and physically push them across the floor to get them to the door. Uh, but it's less than ideal. Currently, we've talked to the uh, facilities group here at Woods Hole, and it looks like we'll have an installation no later than 2023 of a new uh, seven ton overhead hoist. Why seven ton? Well, we'd love to go bigger, but we just cannot do it with the supports from the building. So we're limited to seven, but that will provide us with the lifting capability we require. Next slide, please. So this is the new winch that I mentioned earlier concerning the trace metal system for Skidaway. Um, you can see the motor is mounted up inside of the, the drum itself. It takes away from that large motor gearbox being on the side of the winch, it takes away from all the, the structure that would be required to support it and the torque. So it allows for a much smaller footprint, even though the winch has a, a very large capacity for the strength member. It is quite strong. Uh, it, it allows uh, surprising tensions. Uh, so the engineering of the spool and winch uh, base plate were critical to be able to handle this system. We're looking forward to getting this out and tested and into action shortly. Next slide, please. One of the areas we lack in is being able to dynamically uh, test our loads of our winches. At first, we were able to conduct these types of tests utilizing a crane equipped with a block to lift a weight as opposed to a, a static test where we pull on a fixed point with a load cell in line to read the tension. As our systems have increased in capability, we have exceeded the limits of using the crane, to be honest. The crane method is awkward at best, Ideally, we would construct a fixed tower that is in line with the pad to mount our winches to. This would allow us to lift the actual weights to ensure the winch meets the rated working loads, to ensure any auto render system is set up correctly, and to ensure that the brakes can hold the rated loads. This is something I feel we should have, that should have been constructed at the very beginning of the winch pool days. The photo is an example of a system that's in use at Hobolt that they use for this very purpose. And while this is more than a, the pre, this item is more present than it is future, I find it to be very futuristic. Josh Eaton uh, approached me a few years ago about uh, suggesting to install network hubs into our McCartney winches. Josh does like his gadgets. At the time, it intrigued me, but I wasn't convinced that it would provide enough benefit to warrant the cost. I agreed to allow him to outfit one of our four systems with a hub as a test. Now, this hub is basically would allow Josh to connect to the winch while it is at sea, where he could access any of the firmware parameter settings, log files, uh, anything in the, the computer system via the internet. This hub provided benefits on the very first deployment. One of our McCartney winches was auto rendering or was paying out when the program value for maximum load was exceeded. The setting had been installed in the shop before shipping using parameters provided by the user. Josh was able to sit at his computer, look at the loads of the winch that what it had been seeing, and to make adjustments to the auto render function, allowing science to continue without much delay. This caught the attention of some of the other winch manufacturers, and network hubs are now available on many of their products. Because of this, we can all but eliminate the cost of having factory representatives travel to the winch pool for upgrades, repairs, or modifications. Now we simply plug in at the shop, and the vendor can upload new code or look at performance information without leaving their desk. And one final thing I'd like to just touch on with a lot of the techs, I know they are the busiest people on a vessel at any time. I've worked with a lot of you and I know how hard you work, but we would greatly appreciate it if, during the use of one of our systems at sea. If you happen to think about it and you look at the system, um, 
there are there is a grease gun in every spare parts box that goes out with our systems. We would love it if you wouldn't mind popping the grease gun on every week or two, depending upon systems use, and just hitting the Zerk fittings and the level wine uh, guide bars with a little bit of grease to keep things from moving along smoothly. We always ask our scientific users to do that, but it always doesn't always get the attention that it, it could use. Uh, next slide, please. So that is basically uh, I, the, what our winch pool does. I hope I've provided you with some insight into the East Coast winch pool, its people, its facilities, and where it's going in the years to come. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have at this time. Thank you. I do not see any questions in the chat. And, uh, okay. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, well, uh, thank next, you. Uh, we, yep. Uh, next, um, yep, we have Aaron Davis with uh, NSF, the West Coast Winch Pool. Good morning. I'm Aaron Davis, representing the West Coast Winch Pool, operated by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, but those of you that don't know, uh, our mission is to provide an inventory of oceanographic winches for shared use. Uh, our mission is to provide them in uh, good shape, and we hope to keep our inventory uh, relevant to your needs. Uh, we're primarily a source of winches and mooring spoolers, but we have other machinery as well, capstans, spooling and tensioning gear, and blocks. Next slide, please. So how, how we work. Uh, we're primarily funded by NSF. Our customers generally contact us via email or by phone to uh, let us know what their needs are, and then we try to match them with a piece of equipment that will work for them. We send it to the vessel or job site, and we send it back when the project's done. Uh, if the project is funded by NSF, then this is all done to no cost, at no cost to the customer. Um, but other institutions have to chip in by paying a day rate or rent to cover the and the cost and the cost of freight. Next slide, please. This year, I didn't prevent present slides of uh, each of our individual pieces of equipment to save time. Um, instead, we're going to touch on one of the big things we've been up to. Um, over the past few years, we've been working to improve our inventory of equipment. Uh, one improvement that we felt was sorely needed was a replacement for our TSE spoolers. For those of you that aren't familiar with them, um, our customers use them primarily to um, deploy and retrieve moorings but they are designed for much lighter duty work on dry land. So major components like pumps, hydraulic motors, uh, and whatnot, they wear out very quickly. They also don't have the strength of a marine winch. They're capable of, heavy, of lifting very heavy things, but they're not designed to withstand the dynamic loads that these things create when the ship moves around. So we try not to let them uh, be used for picking up mooring anchors. Um, on the positive side, these spoolers were very simple to use. Uh, they required almost no training. So our aim was to replace them with something that was equally easy, easy to use, but with more power and strength. To this end, we added two new hobble mooring winches in 2020. Uh, the West Coast winch pool got one and the East Coast winch pool got the other. On the West Coast, we've gotten lots of positive feedback. Uh, users find them very easy to use. Uh, the tension meter is very welcome. Um, people like to be able to deploy their moorings anchor first and recover them anchor last when it's more practical. We discourage doing that from the TSE spoolers. And the level wine, we're told, passes high hardware very nicely. Um, although it wasn't designed for other stuff, uh, it can automatically spool any tension member between one quarter and three quarter inch diameter, and it's built to accommodate slip rings. So we found it's a pretty good general purpose winch also, and it's been used several times 
with good results. Next slide, please. So uh, these are, this is a new winch, a custom built winch. And so naturally there have been some issues. We're still working out the kinks. Um, during sea trials, we noticed that the winch would render line when lifting a suspended load. That is, if you lifted some, something, stopped, and then went to lift it again, the load would be dropped a little bit before it would be taken up by the winch. Um, we worked with Hobolt and uh, found that this was a motor drive issue that we, we, we changed the program and that stopped. Uh, more recently, we got reports that the control lever was malfunctioning or the winch wouldn't pay in and out on the first try. Um, some of this is likely due to motor fluxing. Uh, the drive does take a moment to energize the, the motor winding so that it can um, lift the load. And um, some of it may also be that there was a short in one of the cables. So we're getting to the bottom of that. Uh, on its last deployment, we also had an issue with the main motor drive. There was a fault we couldn't resolve. And so the, uh, the, the mission had to be accomplished in a way that didn't include the winch. Um, so, and, uh, and the dynamic braking resistor. Uh, we found that it was not watertight, which obviously is a problem. Um, the braking resistor could short if it got wet. Um, this wouldn't cause a personnel and equipment casualty per se because, because of electrocution. There is a GFI-like system on the winch that uh, shuts power off to it if there is a, a short. But obviously, just having the winch stop unexpectedly in the middle of an operation is a safety hazard in itself. So we've sent this winch to Hobbled, and the East Coast winch is going as well in the near future. And they're going to correct all these outstanding issues. They're going to uh, replace the resistor with one that's watertight. They've already done a lot of testing to figure out uh, some of the issues that we've had. Uh, one of which was uh, recently the East Coast winch was used to lift a vehicle and it uh, dropped it on the deck and there was almost a personnel injury. Um, so they're testing it as we speak. They've found some, uh, they've had some good findings one of which that is, is, is if the winch is actually overloaded, that is if it's lifting too much, in order to protect the wind, uh, the, the motor, the, the motor drive cuts power to the motor, but it does not set the brake. So this is gonna be changed obviously. And we hope to get this winch back in uh, 2022, uh, back into the fleet and operating. Next slide, please. Oh, too far. Could you go back? There you go. So um, another another thing we've been doing to upgrade our inventory is we've had some uh, pretty old CMAC winches that we used as a light duty winch, and uh, we wanted to replace some with that with something that was uh, newer, uh, Appendix A and B compliant. More specifically, it has a tension meter and uh, is capable of has an MCD is capable of handling the breaking strength of the line. Uh, we got one of these uh, hobble light duty winches to replace the CMAC a couple years ago. Initially, it wasn't really well received, and, and I'll tell you why. The CMAC, like the TSE spooler, is dead simple to operate. There's a joystick, pay in, you know, haul in, pay out, and that's kind of it. Uh, but the CMAC required a little bit of uh, a little bit of research. Uh, one had to get to know it, to learn how to go through its menus. Had to program the, the specifics to the line that you're going to put on it so it would level wind properly. So, uh, but uh, users did figure these things out, and eventually uh, we were getting better feedback, and uh, and they're in constant use right now. Um, for this reason, we got a second one uh, that we added to uh, the pool in 2020, and uh, we've gotten really good feedback about these. However, next slide, please. Um, there have been a couple issues with this winch. Um, right after we deployed the first one, uh, I started getting complaints that the cooling fan was loud. Um, but I, I didn't honestly think much about it. And, and one of the reasons I actually hadn't heard it, when I actually heard the thing, I, I thought, wow, that, that is quite loud.
but it's also uh, we found that it was um, the noise it created was above healthy le levels. So what we're doing right now, users uh, want to keep it air cooled. That makes it pr almost self-contained. We still have to plug it into electrical power, but it's one less thing to worry about when you're installing it somewhere on the ship. So we're going to uh, put a, an intake silencer on it and see if that works. <clears throat> uh, and if that does not work, then we're just going to convert it to water cooling. Um, what else? There are fragile protruding things on this winch. Uh, we've had problems with, on the top of the winch there, the, the picture you can see sensors and uh, a, a, a breather for a tank and some other things um, sticking out of the winch. These get knocked off. Um, with the, the joystick in the front, which you cannot see, gets broken. The human machine in, interface or touch screen gets busted. So a lot of this is just an issue of guarding things. So we're creating guards around things and installing them as they break. And um, we're also making sure that those are spares that we're sending with the winch. So if we break a, we have we have a pretty good set of spares that we ship with this. But if we if a new thing breaks off, we make sure that it's in the spares bin next time we ship the winch. And trace metals. This has actually been used quite a few times for trace metal work. Um, the only thing we really have to do to prepare it for that is there's a there's a sheave on the level line that's aluminum or the cheeks of the sheave are aluminum. And so the, the line gets against them, which is not great for the trace metal work. So we just paint that. Um, that seemed like a great solution, but actually the paint comes off and then the line touches the aluminum and the trace metal folks are not thrilled by that. So we're gonna work to get the, that aluminum, uh, the aluminum portions of the sheave replaced with something that's plastic in the near future. Next slide, please. So our uh, our winches have supported science funded by 11 different organizations this year. Um, they've been deployed against uh, on 11 different vessels uh, on many of these vessels uh, many times, and we did spooling services, a lot of spooling services this year because of the downtime that some of the vessels have had. Seven different vessels we've spooled on this year. Next slide, please. And we did some engineering projects. Um, just so you know, I'm available to do engineering projects for uh, any institution in our community. This year, I apologize. There have been a lot of, uh, I had to turn down quite a bit of work because I was I was uh, homeschooling my son at home full time in addition to doing my job. So there wasn't a whole lot of spare time. Nonetheless, I got a few things done. Um, on the Robert Gordon Sproul, we replaced the uh, the level wind on the Marky Desh 3 winch, and that allowed us to use a lower safety factor on its wire rope. Um, Robert Gordon Sproul had no hydraulic diagrams. This is pretty hard for a chief engineer that's never been on the boat. Got some of those made. Um, the Roger Ravel came out of its midlife refit, needing a new fire plan, so I did that. What else? Um, I, I evaluated Roger Ravel's deck several times with different equipment on it. I uh, oh, we do we do of course test our uh, overboard handling systems um, regularly, but we found that we could probably test them in a way that more closely mimics how they're used at sea. So we uh, I wrote new test procedures for these uh, for our ships, and we were able to test the. Uh, side handling systems on Ravel and Sally Ride earlier this summer, and we hope to get the uh, the app systems tested later. And I also designed a radial mount for Robert Gordon's rental. And next slide, please. And that's all I've got. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, customers contact us via email or, or phone call. If you uh, need to use one of our assets or, or me, uh, just give us a call or an email. And uh, if there are any questions, let me know. Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a question for, for both of the pools. Uh, this just came up recently. So uh, uh, I, got a, I got an email saying that somebody was unhappy because they wanted to get a, get a witch. And, but they weren't NSF, they were ONR funded. 
And I thought, wow, I've never heard of this happening before. So my question to you is when somebody that's not from NSF, NSF funded, wants to reserve a winch, do you, what do you do? Do you say, well, no, not until a certain time? I, I really didn't know how to answer that question. So can you guys tell me? Well, I'll go first. Um, so NSF funded projects do take priority. So if there's an end, uh, we don't typically, we try not to just bump somebody. Um, like if the ONR rented a winch and then somebody else has NSF work, we try not to, we try to find other winches and whatnot that will meet everybody's needs. Uh, but especially in scheduling though, when we're just scheduling work to be done later, you know, later this year or next year, we try to fill up the, the schedule with NSF work first. And then after that, we, we loan it to other institutions or we, we to ONR or, or the Navy or whoever. And we do not typically let um, commercial entities use our winches, except for unless we get special permission from NSO. Same with you, Brian. Hmm. You must have gone. Well, Okay. Uh, I'm I sorry, guess, Brian had to leave at the half hour for another. That's fine. I assume it is somewhat the same. Um, so I, I guess that you don't let them reserve something until the schedules are set or at what point? Is there a cutoff time when you said, okay, you can reserve this now? Um, No, there's not really a cutoff time. Like I say, we, we just try to fill up the schedule with NSF funded work first. I mean, this typical, we, we could typically, typically answer almost any request we get with a piece of equipment. There's, there's some equipment like the mooring spoolers, for example, we just run out or, or more frequently we have them, but they're broke. So we have to we only have a limited number that uh, we can loan out at a given time. Um, so if, okay. if the schedule is full of NSF work, we just say we don't have anything to offer you. Okay. Yep. So thank Alex's you very much. Alex's hand Aaron. is up. Yes, that's me. Uh, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that Aaron, uh, a lot of those projects that he worked on were for scripts, but he is available for the whole fleet. So if you have any engineering sort of projects that you think Aaron or Josh can help you with, don't be afraid to reach out to them. They are for everyone. So next we have Jules Hummond with the UHDAS program. All right. Uh, okay, I guess I'm live. You can hear me, right? Yeah, that's probably yes. it. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, well, I was expecting to do this tomorrow, so I have, I have uh, this may be a little stumbly. Um, but anyway, uh, so there are two presentations for UHDAS. And I tried to make it so that almost none of the slides overlap. So there's some information here in this talk, and there's also some information in the UNOLS talk, which is uh, 10 days from now or so. Um, in addition, uh, my original um, allocation was 10 minutes. So I'll see if I can keep this succinct. So we are UHDAS, University of Hawaii Data Acquisition System. Um, our goal is to create or shepherd um, the best real-time, near real-time shipboard ADCP data currents, ocean currents possible on a ship with an eye towards long-term use and uh, recoverability if there's a problem. We are primarily supported by NSF for the academic research fleet. Um, and, but we also have uh, UHDAS on all of the NOAA ships and um, we receive support from ONR as well as other um, institutions that have uh, basically chartered um, UHDAS. Next slide. So there are 17 UNOLS ships and three polar ships. We have 11 NOAA ships and six other ships who pay a subscription to do this. There are two volunteer observing ships, which are 
presently in stasis, the UHDAS aspect of them. Anyway, I counted up 78 ADCPs that we're responsible for. Um, so we do see a lot of data. UHDAS collects it, timestamps it, writes it down, uh, does preliminary processing on it. The computer send, uh, there's an ATSI website. Um, if you go to the uh, presentation, the link should take you to the ATSI website. Um, we get daily emails from each of the ships uh, with daily automated status emails. Um, and we, we read them to try to figure out what, what kind of problems there might be. Um, next slide, please. So this is a list of the actual ships where things are installed. And um, I, I could have had um, uh, additional logos to indicate the funding sources that, um, that, that help us go. Everything we do is in support of the UHDAS uh, ecosystem, basically. And so each one of these ships provides valuable uh, information for us on what can possibly go wrong with an ADCP or with an ancillary feed. And uh, we have been trying to improve our, um, our plots and our monitoring, uh, as well as algorithms for processing. Next slide. So this is kind of down in the weeds, but these are the things that are directly related to the um, sh uh, ship operations. And um, so one thing that's new is that the bridge plot now has a, a ghost outline of a ship showing the ship's orientation. So now you can immediately look at the bridge plot and you don't have to think about what the heading of the ship is. You look at the bridge plot, you can see where the ship is and you can see that the currents are going off to the side in some direction. It's, it's a, it was a long time coming, but um, so Joseph added that earlier in the year. And as we update the UHDAS code on ships, uh, that will also uh, become available. We have two new sets of plots. The um, GGA time diagnostic plots are, uh, have been rolled out on more ships because it, it started coming in last year. Um, we've, we have found that um, temperature is an extremely valuable diagnostic. If there's a problem with the temperature, that generally suggests that there's a, an ADCP failure in our future. Um, and so those plots are going to be available on the at sea website as well as in, in our monitoring uh, as we do the updates. Um, the speed log is available uh, as a web torrent on the website at sea. Um, we can also output it via serial or UDP if you want to ingest that. Um, we are monitoring the offset between the ADCP and the GPS used for processing. And so uh, that is another number that we dial in and that helps get rid of um, hiccups in the data between uh, on station and underway, or at least specifically in, in turns. So if you're going on a line and you stop to do a CTD and you swivel the ship around to point into the wind, there used to be artifacts there. If the ADCP was in a very different place from the GPS, a huge example of that would be the Healy, where the ADCPs are, I don't know, 50 meters away from where the GPS is. So the, the artifact was quite large until we introduced that. Um, because of the uh, best practices subcommittee and the fact that I volunteered to spearhead some shipboard ADCP best practices, I got motivated to create a best practices for the best practices page in the UHS documentation, as we do updates that will also get rolled out to the ship. And I welcome input on how to improve that. Um, another thing that recently got added is um, in addition to the uh, up to date from the beginning of the cruise to now net CDF file that the scientists can use. I've also got it uh, doing from the beginning of the day to now so that if they want to do frequent um, Data transfers, they're not, they're not retransmitting the entire thing. It's just part of a day. Those files, I believe, are under a megabyte apiece. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Joseph Gum joined us from Scripps, and he has lots and lots of experience with ODF and going to C and CTDs and programming. And Drew Brombach has joined us from, uh, from Colorado, where he was doing Doppler, but in the air, not, not under C. Uh, oh, and we're hiring. If you click on the link, you've still got a week to apply. Um, next slide. So this is just a screenshot of what the bridge plot looks like. And you can see the, uh, um, the ship in gray and the currents pointing uh, slightly off to the left. Um, 
this happens to be at sea, uh, in port, so it's not, the currents are not going very fast. Um, next slide. So we had a problem with two ships, one NOAA ship and one UNAL ship. When they came out of a, a, an import period, um, there was this utter junk at the bottom of the profiles. This is typically due to electrical interference and often has to do with either the ADCP cable being uh, too close to a power source, or um, we've also seen this happen when, when the UPS uh, got changed. The UPS had its own switching um, frequency that was very close to the frequency of the instrument. Um, there is nothing we can do about this problem except to solve it by moving the cable, moving the deck unit, um, searching for errant grounds, or uh, it, it's a very difficult problem to diagnose and treat. And you can't do it in the, um, uh, it, it, it's not something we can fix in post-processing. We can try to eliminate it, but basically we just have to delete stuff and that's, that's unacceptable. Um, next slide. I'll be quick on this one. Um, basically, this slide changes every presentation from one year to the next year. The numbers of the years get updated. So we're running a 2018 operating system on most ships. We have now gotten everything working under the 2020 uh, long-term stable release. And we've got that out on four ships. Um, we will be in touch about upgrades. I don't imagine that we're actually gonna be traveling to any ships until maybe spring but we can take advantage of import periods and have either you ship us the computer or we can work with people uh, that have sufficient Linux experience to be able to get you to put the, um, uh, put the operating system on and then put it on the network and we can uh, do, it remote, do it remotely. Next slide. Okay, this is a list of all the things that happened with the academic research fleet ADCPs and because that's 20 ships, but we're dealing with 40 ships, uh, the number of problems were basically doubled this. But we had problems with corrosion at the transducer end of the uh, cable, um, resulting in problems with one ocean surveyor and one workhorse 300. In those kinds of cases, if you don't actually get water into the instrument, you replace the bulkhead connector and the cable. Uh, the Thompson was the one with the electrical noise. Um, we have had two problems with temperature that showed up and they were followed by a failure of the instrument. Um, there was one case where the cable for the ocean surveyor uh, was terminated at the deck end by RDI and um, they, in a, rare, in a rare situation, they got two lines swapped. And so the, there were two beams that were swapped. So uh, that ship had to live with a, we had to figure that out and fix it in software for three months before they came and fixed the cable. Um, Low background, uh, low, we've got, uh, anyway, ADCP failures exist, and this is a catalog of them. Um, it's not been a bad year. It's been a pretty typical year. Some of these things take a lot of time to troubleshoot. Next slide. Uh, ABX2, um, if an antenna goes bad, then we lose heading. That happened in at least one ship and perhaps two this year. Um, we've had two different cases of a CPATH. Um, having reduced quality or dead reckoning um, in the UNALS uh, uh, in the UNALS talk, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, there have been problems with um, data transmission over networks, so we can get gaps or duplicated messages when network switches are not behaving correctly or when drivers are not behaving correctly. Um, we can have situations where there's a UDP feed that we're collecting data from and what's at the other end of that is not what we were told, or there are two things coming in on that same port. Uh, you can have the same problem with serial. So with serial, you can have a poor connection and it, it, it wiggles and makes um, junk in the, um, makes junk in the data set. Uh, you can't win. Um, there is one computer, one installation that's a virtual computer. And I would not say that that is perfect. Uh, the computer time is jumpy by not more than one second, thank goodness, but fractions of a second. Um, and the whole system is vulnerable to network problems. Next slide. Coming up in 2022, we're gonna be moving to the, uh, in spring, the 2022 Exabuntu operating system will come out. 
So probably sometime in the summer, we'll start trying to modernize to that one. Um, and then we'll start uh, testing it. And I don't know whether we'll be rolling out rolling it out in 2022 or not. Because of COVID, there may be some ships that go from 1804 to 2204. I don't think we're going to try to get everybody up to 2004 before moving forward, but we'll see. Like I said, we're hiring one more person. Uh, that person is uh, would be helping us with the emails and troubleshooting and installation, et cetera. Uh, we will continue with uh, improvements in documentation and also more in the UNALS talk. We're going to be testing the, oops, the pinnacle is not on the Sally ride. That's on the Neil Armstrong. That's a big typo. Uh, my apologies to the Neil Armstrong. The pinnacle 45 is an RDI instrument and that's going to be tested in January on the Neil Armstrong. The EC-150 is a Kongsberg uh, Doppler sonar, a Kongsberg ADCP that we're going to be testing on the Sally ride. I'll fix that slide, Brandy. Don't release this yet. Um, and cyber security impacts. UCSD is going to be forbidding us to use email to get our <laughs> automated emails off the ship starting in 2022. So we're, we're going to have to figure out what to do about that. And last but not least, um, I would like to encourage people to go to the community channel that says UHDAS and let me know if you're interested in some uh, UHDAS training. So this is specifically for operating UHDAS, sort of an introductory thing for people who are new. I had a request from uh, um, Alex on the Pelican, uh, not Alex Wren, but Alex Ham on the Pelican who wanted to know whether we gave any training. So yes, Alex, we do sign up for it and we'll figure something out. Next slide. This is, uh, you, if you look at the presentation later, you can read this. This slide is something that happens every year and we still have the same requests. Let us know when things change um, and give us lots of warning. That's the summary and last slide. Here we are in our happy meeting with COVID. We have a daily meeting. It starts at 1130 right before lunch. So it doesn't last very long. And uh, we all tune in and that's what we do. We don't generally go into work, but there we are. Smiling for the camera. That's it. Um, I should quit. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. Oh, yeah. Um, please put please we, put questions in the uh, in the community UHDAS channel. Yep. Yep. We're gonna go ahead and move on to um, Rick Trask's uh, presentation. Rick, would you prefer um, to Rick, share your presentation, or would you like me to do it? If you can do it, that would be that would be very good. I have a hard enough time seeing things as it is here. Okay. And then we can uh, then questions for Jules can be in the in the community, like she asked. If you have um, questions, we can uh, get those answered throughout the week. And so now we have uh, Rick Rick Trask, uh, the NSF Wire Pool man Manager. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So a uh, couple of things I'd like to go over. Uh, one is a quick overview of the wire pool for those people who may not be really familiar with it. I'd like to just uh, point out the user's guide to the wire pool database, talk a little bit about a lubrication study that we're playing with, and then uh, mention some things about a, uh, an additional point of reference for noting tension member events. So next slide. I don't see the slide, so it's hard for me to know if it's up or not. Uh, it says wire pool over, overview. Yeah, okay. So unlike the winch pools, there's only one wire pool that services all UNOS vessels. We maintain an inventory of tension members that are commonly used by those vessels. When a vessel needs a tension member, we field those requests and put together a request package that includes the original request plus some information about the vessel and about available inventory. And that package is then sent to NSF and with their approval, the tension member is distributed. Uh, we also are funded to test samples of wire rope, cables and synthetics that are sent to us from UNOL's vessels. 
In addition, in, in addition, we maintain a database that contains much of the history about each vessel's tension members, which can be accessed by the vessel operator or their designee. So this brings me to the second topic, which is the uh, user's guide for navigating the database. So next slide, please. And then I hope the one that follows, which is... Yes, Wirepool Database User's Guide, what it okay. includes. So the User's Guide contains all the details that you would ever want for navigating and using the database. Uh, probably the better section, it also contains a section with abbreviated, for each section, uh, abbreviated instructions uh, when all you need is a quick refresher on how to do something without all the excruciating details. Uh, next slide. The user's guide is located on several places. One is on the login page on the left-hand side. I've got it circled in red there. Next slide. The second place for those vessels or for those institutions that have more than one vessel, uh, you see this, this uh, view and the user guide is on the left. If, you're, if your institution only has one vessel, you don't see this view. But uh, in that case, next slide, uh, you would see the uh, user guide or you would be able to access the user guide from the ship report page. So that's uh, on the upper right there. Next slide. I hope that that says lubrication study update. Yeah, and then the next one, purpose. And the next one, uh, let's see, the next one, okay. So the lubrication study was designed to compare the condition of a cable that's lubricated once a year to one that is lubricated monthly as part of a normal CTD recovery at sea. And the way we went about this is we took uh, six samples, all 10 meters of uh, 322, and we submerge them in the, off of the Huey dock daily, Monday through Friday, for several hours. After they're submerged, they're pulled out, coiled, and hung outside in the weather without any fresh water rinse and uh, remain there till the next day. One group of uh, samples, that would be the one, two, and samples one, two, and three, they're lubricated monthly. And the other group, samples four, five, and six, are lubricated annually, once a year. Uh, the lubricant, uh, Corrosion inhibitor is, a, is the applied by a core lube system using Grignard OLLD2. So the uh, monthly lubrication of uh, the group one samples is, is done just as the samples come out of the water. No rinsing, no drying. They come out of the water, they go through the lubricator. Every six months, a test article is taken from each group and a brake test is inspected or rather brake test and close inspection uh, is made under a microscope. Uh, we're currently 20 mo 21 months into a 60 month project. We would like to run this for five years uh, if at all possible, because that's kind of a typical life for a CTD cable. Uh, Barbara Callahan has been the driving force in making sure that this whole study uh, moves ahead in terms of getting those samples in the water every day. So it's been a big, Big, big help there. Next slide, please. So you should see a couple of pictures, hopefully. Uh, on the left is a photo of the small well in the Hui dock where these samples are hung uh, in seawater. And then on the right is a picture of the mobile lubricator cart that we use to lubricate the samples as, as they come out of the water. So just as those samples are pulled out uh, after being in for several hours, they, when at the time when they're gonna get lubricated, they run through that lubricator, get coiled up and again, hung outside. There's no, no rinsing, no washing, no drying, comes out of the water, just like it would be coming out after a CTD station. Next slide, please. 
So uh, preliminary results from the lubrication study show that the sample that's received monthly lubrication has zero e-kink breaks to date, but the sample that is only lubricated uh, annually has started to have some inner armor wires break during the e-kink test. And you can see that in June on sample four, June, 2021 sample four, the e-kink uh, result was 11% of the metallic cross-sectional area. The Breaking strengths are dropping from what they were when the cable was new, but they are still above the manufacturer's minimum. The lowest one of which is uh, the most recent, uh, from the most recent test of the sample that is only lubricated annually. So that would be sample four, and that's uh, broke recently at 10,980 pounds. So in appearance, if you look at the next uh, slide, please. The, uh, on the left, this is a photograph taken with the uh, up close magnified. The sample on the left uh, is uh, from number, sample number one. It's the ones that are being lubricated monthly. And sample number four is photographed on the right. You can see has a lot more corrosion. Uh, the annual, annually lubricated samples definitely showing the more, more corrosion. And all of the annually lubricated samples are becoming more difficult to coil, presumably because the individual wires are being inhibited, inhibited from moving due to the advanced corrosion. Next slide, please. So, I'd like to make a pitch for adding a new reference for noting tension member events to whatever you're currently using. So this is not a, instead of, this is a, a pitch to add this reference. Next slide. So hopefully it's a cartoon of a ship with a winch and A-frame and package being lowered. So this figure is set is to set the stage for ways that can be used to report events occurring with a tension member. Vessels often report the length of wire out, WO, which has usually been zeroed when the package is being lowered uh, at the, uh, when the package is at the, at the water surface. An additional approach is to make note of the length or distance from the dry end. Uh, that would be the end uh, of the, at the core of the winch. Next slide, please. So to illustrate the advantage of using the distance from the dry end, I offer the following very simple example, not to insult your intelligence, but suppose you start with a tension member that's 10,000 meters long and an event of some kind, say a, a tension event, occurs when you've got uh, 1,200 meters uh, out or wire out and this location uh, is the same as uh, 8,800 meters from the dry end, 10,000 minus 1,200 meters, the 8,800. If uh, you continue to use the tension member and you need to cut back and re-terminate, you end up cutting back, say, 100 meters. So the location of the previous tension event is now at 1,100 meters because you've cut off 100 meters from the wet end, but it's still at 8,800 meters from the dry end. And then say you continue and you have to cut back another 200 meters, uh, it puts the location of the previous tension event now at 900 meters, but it's still at 8,800 meters from the dry end. So the event location relative to the wet end changes with every cutback, but when using the dry end as the reference, the location doesn't change, except of course, uh, if you're, you end the wire. So next slide, please. So the benefits include less bookkeeping to track the location of events. When also, when the total length of the tension member becomes less than the recorded distance to an event from the dry end, the affected area is no longer a concern. You actually, it gets cut off. Tracking event locations is going to be valuable when evaluating the condition of specific locations along a tension member. 
This is particularly true for synthetics, where we're gonna to need to obtain a history of tension location, tension frequency, and rope degradation. We will hopefully be able to cut out a suspect section of synthetic rope and test it. This will allow us to evaluate the impact of certain operations on rope condition. We have very little experience with synthetics and we're gonna to need to gather this information before we'll really feel comfortable with uh, deciding what safety factors should be used with synthetics. Uh, something that has been not done in the past is splice a new section of rope to replace the degraded section. So we can cut out a section, we can test it, but we don't necessarily have to shorten the rope. We can throw in a new section, splice it in place and continue on. So this is a new feature that we're not used to with synthetics. So uh, I would really, I ask you to consider adding this reference to uh, however you are currently noting events now so that we can, uh, going forward, we can get used to it. And when we put synthetics into place, we'll have a way to evaluate uh, their condition and know where those tension, uh, tension events occurred. And I think that's it. Any questions? Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions today, uh, but I would encourage individuals to reach out to Rick uh, via email with questions. Um, we're going to have to end the session so that we can start our speed networking event and get it in before um, the annual meeting. Um, so thank you, Rick, for that. That was really interesting, particularly with the new uh, reference um, stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone in a few minutes in the speed networking. You can find it under uh, agenda sessions. Um, and then it's or under agenda. It's right below sessions for speed network. So. We'll see you there. <laughs>